guys. All right, everybody, come on in, grab your seats, grab a Bible if you don't have one. We're going to be in Mark chapter 15 today. Mark chapter 15, verse 40, 40 through 41. We're only going to be looking at a few verses this morning. Um, it's a semi-topical teaching, which is something that I, I never really do, and I'm horrible at it. And so uh, when I was first praying about these verses, I, I just thought, why on earth are we doing here? But I, I believe that the Lord has, has a really um, powerful message just for, for all of us, a simple reminder, if you will, um, of, of just walking with Jesus. I think that as, as we look in this text in Mark 15, um, Jesus has just been crucified uh, where the Son of God was, uh, you know, hanging on, on the cross. And we're not going to get into all of the crucifixion. Um, the sun was darkened as the light of God and the light of the world was, was brutally murdered by mankind. Um, and the, the light and the truth of God's word was rejected by man. And so the, the sun goes dark in this very apocalyptic scene that we see in Mark chapter 15. And then after that, um, the veil in the temple, it says, was torn from top to bottom, um, which is, is uh, such a beautiful, rich, symbolic thing that the Lord did there. Uh, not just symbolic, though, it was quite literally torn. Um, a wall, a, a veil that they said could have been just about this thick was uh, made of, of wool and these different tapestries and gold, and, and it would have been torn from the top to the bottom, which is scientifically impossible. Um, but, but we see as, as this veil, what did it stand for, though? It was... It was the separation from kind of the general public to, to, to not be able to go in or to see the things um, and the sacrifices that were poured out to, to make us right with God. And this intimate relationship with God that was established there in the Holy of Holies as the, the veil was torn from top to bottom. It was a declaration from God to us that now his presence and his, his spirit is available to everybody. And what used to separate us is now torn. And, and how powerful this chapter is in the middle of the richness of all of this deep, you know, theology and these deep truths. And we could go and spend the rest of our lives exploring it. And I challenge you to do that. Continue to dive into the, the intricacies of the word of God. I'm challenged by some of you as I hear um, you talk about the Lord. And as I, you know, get to sit down and breakfast and get to uh, speak with you here, I challenge you to continue to explore the wonderful depths of God's word. Uh, one of uh, beautiful Proverbs says, it's the, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it's the glory of kings to reveal it. So dig into the word of God. Search and find it. It's just beautiful truths in there. But we see here at this, this intense moment where, where our salvation was completed at the cross and 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 Jesus is now there and I always hear frequently hear people say he was there alone at the cross you ever heard anyone say that you know you always hear people say oh he was there all alone at the cross all the disciples left him and you know and and so uh, it kind of got me wondering when I'm reading this text in Mark 15 41 got me got me wondering well that's not true there were people there there were still people that were faithful to Jesus even up until the very end there weren't many Absolutely not, but there were some, and I'm challenged by their example, because the cross was one of the darkest moments for those disciples. The cross was the pinnacle of, of human and believer and faith suffering in the middle of trials, and here Jesus is in the middle of that moment and, and where it is finished, and the Father has turned his face, and all of this crazy um, darkness of our weight, of our sin, is pouring upon him. And then, and then there's still these, these people there. These disciples made it to the middle of that storm. And have you ever seen believers, as they walk with Jesus, and they're really happy to be involved with the, the happy things about being a Christian, the joyful, warm and fuzzy part of fellowship and potluck, the delicious side of being a Christian, right? Um, but the, the pain is where a lot of times people say, I did not sign up for this, and they leave. And so here at the cross, we do see 
some, but we don't see, there's a few people that we're surprised not to see, isn't there? Peter, uh, w- when we, we think about Peter, who said to Jesus, and I, and I quote, even if all are made to stumble, I will not be stumbled, Jesus. Where is he in the middle of this moment? Where is Peter? Where were his words that, that he was so convinced about himself? And I think that challenges those of us that are so convinced about our own faithfulness to the Lord to stop and say, wait, hold up. Where is my heart? A- a- am I wrong even for thinking that highly of myself? Where is, where are my favorite nickname in all of scripture? Where are the stinking sons of thunder, right? James and John, where are those two? The sons of thunder who when Jesus wasn't welcomed into his city, they look to their master, they look to Jesus and they say, hey, hey Jesus, yeah, I've read the Bible. I'm, I'm elaborating a little bit. I've read the Bible. I know that Elijah has called down fire and so is Elisha. Do you want us to call down fire and consume this entire city that won't let you come in. And Jesus looks over at them and he's like, you guys are crazy. You're, you don't get it. But where are these guys that are so committed to the work of Jesus that they're willing to even destroy other people? Where are they at the, the, the most dark moment in history? Where are they? Where are they? It isn't these men. They're not there. And so I, I think just even in that, the example is really powerful. Um, I'm not someone that names my sermons, but today I am, clearly, as you can see. It says that disciple till the end, um, because I, I, I want to explore with you guys just this, this concept. What kept them following Jesus? What kept them near to Jesus, even until the very end? And I think from this, we, we all can walk away with something. I know, and, be, and as we, Rachel and I shared, and I always want to, you know, be real with you guys, um, just as I love how real my wife is, as she said, you know, it's, it's like as a mom, it's difficult to find time to read the Bible. You know, there's distractions. We, we are all believers in Christ that are, that are wanting to walk hard after Jesus, and we struggle at times, and we fail, and we fall, but thank God for his grace. And I, what we don't want to walk away today with for any of you is oh wow those missionaries are so amazing um or you know the pastor the staff of the church they're all so amazing man i wish i'm so glad they're doing what they're doing because god has a calling on your lives and you are disciples of christ whether or not you realize your calling i'm here today to say if you believe in jesus christ if you place your faith in him if you believe that, that he is the son of God, that he lived the perfect life you could never, died the death that you deserve and rose again, if this is you, then you are a disciple. And he's calling you to be a disciple that stays till the end. And sometimes we read the, the Christian missionary autobiographies. Anyone else like autobiographies here in this place? I love them. Um, I love them. And we read them and we go, why isn't God doing that in my life? They're just so amazing. Why isn't he doing this in my generation? They're just so amazing. And we sometimes see what they do. Maybe they wake up at four in the morning and they read their Bibles and they pray. And we're like, oh, I'm just going to start reading my Bible at four in the morning and then I'll become an epic missionary, right? The thing that we miss is that they're not doing that because they're so strong. They're doing that because they know how truly weak they are. And what we need to be is the disciples that draw near to Jesus, because, not because we're so strong and epic, but because we're so weak that I know, God, if I don't have you, I can't breathe today. God, if I don't have you, all I will do is create destruction in the lives of the people around me. All I will do is blow up my family life. All I will do is blow up my marriage if I don't have you today. And then we will get up at the times that we need to get up and do the things that we need to do. Not because we're strong, but because we're weak. And when we are weak, what? He is strong. And so as we look at this text, I think it paints it differently as we, as we study in who's there and why they're there at the foot of the cross. Would you, if you don't have your Bibles open, open up to Mark chapter 15, verse 40 and 41. And I'm going to read it for you here as we start. And then we're going to look at it a little bit together. Verse 40, there were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the less, and of Joseph and uh, Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Here's the faithful, right? The faithful women, majority of women are, are here. 
We have Mary Magdalene. This is the woman who, in, in other accounts of scripture, we see that Jesus had cast out seven demons out of this woman. She was completely dedicated to his service. We see her all over the scriptures. We see Mary. We see the mom, right? Well, what does it say, though? It doesn't say the mom of Jesus. Mary, the mother of James, uh, the less, and of Joseph. And it's interesting because frequently the family members of Jesus Christ, when they're mentioned in scripture, they don't say, hey, Mary, the mom of Jesus. They'll say, uh, you know, Mary this, or they'll say, you know, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name right now. James, you know, the, the brother, or they, they just kind of take Jesus out of it, and they identify them as a disciple for the most part. And, and this family relationship, just as Jesus, when the disciples come to him and they say, hey, your mom and your brothers are here. They want you to stop. They think you're crazy. Um, and Jesus looks at them and says, well, who, who are my mother and my brothers and my father? And who are they? But it's those that hear and do the will of, and the word of God. And so you see that relationship being diminished, not for the sake that it, that it is a, not an important relationship, but for, for the fact that the, the emphasis is more on Jesus, less on their relationship to him with bloodline. We see Mary, from the beginning of the ministry, she's the one who compelled him into ministry. She believed in him. She believed the word of God. When God came to her, and when God spoke his word to her and prophesied over her life and said, hey, you're going to have a son and his name will be Emmanuel. And she believed that. Has the Lord spoken into your life? Have you been there? Have you seen God deliver you like this Mary Magdalene? Have you seen God deliver you from the power of hell? Think about your life. Are you maybe like, like a, a, a Mary, the, the, the mother of James, where you have been involved in bringing Jesus into situations and you've seen Jesus move? It wasn't Mary that turned water into wine, was it? But we, she was there, and she brought Jesus into the middle of it, and Jesus changed lives. Have you been in that situation where you've brought Jesus into something, and you've watched him radically transform it? If this is your story, you're on the right track. Because these are the people that were there with Jesus up until the very end. Sal uh, Salmone, I wish I had something profound to say about her, but the only time we mention her next is when she brought spices um, to, to try to prepare the body of Jesus. Which says a lot, doesn't it? It's true. But she was there. She was ready to serve. And I have more to say on that a little bit later. But we have to acknowledge this men because I think a lot of times we kind of joke because uh, Eve um, at the beginning, and she was the first to sin. And as men, we sometimes we can say, all right, you know, women, well, Eve was the first to sin, this and that. But how many times have we brought up the fact that it was nearly entirely women that were there at the cross when Jesus died? We have to, if we're going to give them the blame for the first one, we have to give them a little bit of credit for the second one as well. <laughs> but this isn't about gender. This is not a some, uh, sermon about gender at all. Because in heaven there's no gender. It says we'll be like the angels, neither male nor female. It's not that that's important. It's a disciple. I want to be a good disciple. And, uh, and I know you do as well. Brothers and sisters, the question today, this morning that I'm asking is how, how do you be a good disciple of Jesus? In contrast, we see the other disciples. Follow me here if you can. Uh, the other disciples, they ministered alongside Jesus. They ministered with Jesus. They would call themselves frequently disciples. And this was a word and a, and a term that was frequently used within that culture. The term of disciple and rabbi, which would be master, was frequently a relationship that they would have understood and known. The rabbi would teach them for a period of time. And then after a certain sort of, like I think of an internship. And after that period was over, frequently they would be given their own ministries, and then one day they would be given their own disciples, that they would train up and do the same thing, rinse and repeat in for, to affinity, right? And so now we see here, maybe I think their mentality was messed up a bit, because maybe at some point these disciples began to believe the lie that the enemy can speak to us, which is, you know, one day you're going to be so strong that you don't need to, to depend on Jesus anymore, and you can kind of do this on your own. They might have to identified themselves by saying, I'm a disciple, First, and then the, the, the power and the importance that can be associated with, with these kinds of words. In, in scripture, we see the word, you know, uh, bishop and, and deacon. And, and the word deacon it means errand runner. Literally means like the Uber Eats guy, right? It, it's not a rank. It's not something that's super important. It's kind of the lowest, the guy that goes and busts your table after you eat and get gravy everywhere. It's that guy. And this is the role that God puts into scripture, saying, you are a busboy. When you serve me, you're a servant. You're a slave. You have no rights, just like my wife was speaking about earlier. But all of the glory of heaven is given to us. 
And so how beautiful is it? Maybe the disciples lost sight of the truth of God's word. Maybe their identity was more wrapped up in the work of the ministry that they were doing. Do you remember when the disciples were sent out by Jesus? And they were sent out in twos, and they were sent to go perform miracles, and they, got, they healed people, and they saw the Lord drive out demons, and they saw this crazy work of God happening. Could you imagine that? I mean, some of you have, have probably been there when you prayed and you saw the Lord heal someone. Maybe some of you have that testimony. Maybe you, some of you have seen God deliver people from, from some sort of demonic um, influence or even oppression or, or, or possession. Maybe you've seen the Lord move as you've prayed for provision in something, just as we did this Sunday. Praise God for that, for your church and how he's been providing. And, and you know, may, maybe that's been something that you've seen. But as our identity is not there. And that's the challenge. Their identity could have been wrapped up in the work. But Jesus challenged them back after they came back from this powerful work. And they, they were marveling to Jesus. And they said, and in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, they came back and they were in wonder. It says that the demons were in submission to who? Jesus? No, the text says that they wondered that the demons were in submission to them. Oh, that's dangerous, isn't it? You see this sometimes in the body of Christ. When we take the power of God and we begin to say, okay, this is mine, therefore I am the ruler over this. Oh, that's a dangerous place to be. And Jesus corrects them and he says, don't wonder about those things. Don't be in awe over that. Just be totally humbled and amazed that your names are even written in the book of life. Amen. But anyone that comes in with spiritual pride or any of us today, I'm not going to point fingers at other people. I'm going to point fingers at us in this room as God's word always does when we read it correctly. Any of us in this room with spiritual pride today, we need to humble ourselves and just say, God, the fact that I'm even called by your name is life-shatteringly amazing. And so with that, these disciples, they, I, I don't know if they missed something, but clearly they're not here. And we look at these other ones who are, and I'm blessed by them. Verse 41 gives us a clue. This is where we'll hover for the, uh, for the next little bit of time. It says, and they also, what did they do? What did they do, you guys? It says they followed him, and they ministered to him. That was their only desire. They followed him. What does it mean to follow? It says to go. It's so simple. Kids understand this. When I tell my son, follow me, and I walk around the house, and he follows me. Or when we go into a public bathroom, as a parent, and my wife's a bit of a germaphobe sometimes. You can own that one, right, honey? Perfect. So when we go into the bathrooms, it's like, don't touch anything, you know? I wish I had a bubble. And, and so I tell him, I'm like, follow me, and then hold on to my, my pant pockets. And he does that. And you're like, follow me all around. He knows what it means to follow. Why do we have to overcomplicate what it means to follow Jesus? It's literally that simple. Following him and staying close to him to go wherever he goes. Isaiah 40 is a beautiful verse talking about those that are strong and it says they will fail. Those, the youth and all of their strength and their huge muscles, they will also fail. For those of you that aren't young and don't have huge giant muscles, which is only a few of us in this room, um, you have great comfort to know that it says that they will fail, but those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. This word wait here means to look earnestly. We don't have a dog um, because I'm a horrible human being and I don't want a dog, but <laughs> bear with me. When you, when you put a treat in your hand and the dog knows it's there, what does he do? His hand, his, his, his eyes looking at you, he's like, I just love you, master. You're so amazing to me. Thank you for, no, the dog's like this, right? Up, down, up, down, over, around. Doesn't matter what you do with your hand, the dog will be looking for the treat. And that's what this word means here, to wait. It's not speaking about patience. The word wait is speaking about our attention. It's a fixed eyes on him. If you wait on the Lord, he will renew you. That's the secret to, to being a disciple of Jesus Christ is we are waiting on the Lord, not for the next turning point in ministry, not for the next person to get saved, not for any of those other things that we can wait on. As a disciple of Jesus, we wait on the Lord. He is our goal, looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. It's him, and we wait and we look at him, and we keep like, like that simple dog. Our eyes are fixed on the price, right? And, and that one day when we finally get there, and how glorious it will be. But for us, we're not speaking in this day and age. These people, right, they waited physically on Jesus. They followed Jesus physically. 
And, and I love that. I think it's a beautiful thing. And the Lord may call you physically to get up and to move somewhere like he did for my wife and I. He might do that. But for the majority of us, that probably won't be the case. And that's fantastic. Because God has a calling and he has a leading for you in your life where you are. If he calls you, you better go. But he is calling you to something here where you are. And you better go to that. I'm not just speaking about moving physical locations. I'm speaking about a heart that is willing, and I believe God's word is speaking, about a heart that is willing to go wherever he calls you to go, even if that is into the, the, the cubicle of the person at your work that you just can't stand, the nails on the chalkboard person at your work. Maybe that's them. Maybe the Lord's calling you there. Maybe that is following the Lord. His, praise God for the Holy Spirit because he'll make it clear what you need to do and who you need to talk to, and what your ministry is to be. But you have a ministry disciple. You have a ministry disciple. And so the Lord is calling them, not necessarily physical location. God is, to follow the Lord not only is just doing, because as Americans, we're very productivity-based in our thinking. If I have a checklist and I check it off, it's the best feeling on the planet. I don't know if you guys are like me. And as an American, we are built to think that way but I- in other places and we experience this in italy we'll eat lunch and you just sit forever and you don't do anything and i feel felt so unproductive at first but i'm learning that their priority is relationship and so if you scoot out of there you just eat and they've prepared uh, prepared all this mood for you and you just leave um then then i mean how offensive is that because they prioritize relationship. And so um, how, how sweet it is to know that the Lord is challenging us to that kind of, of a mentality, not just the checklist, but to really understand, Lord, where's my heart in regards to what you're wanting to do? Am I resistant to your work and your word? When we follow the Lord, it's not just only in our actions, it's also in our heart attitudes. Let me say that again. When we follow the Lord, it's not just in our actions, it's in our heart attitudes. Have you ever done the right thing with the wrong heart? Raise your hand if you're a dirty little sinner like me. Yeah? Okay. It's really, it's really easy to do that. It's easy to fall into that. And, and honestly, this is normal. That's why we ask the Lord, search my heart. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the right way, Lord. And the Lord will challenge us, just as James 1, 23 says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. He who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does, looking into God's word and following him through his word. That's why I spoke about this word of God is so important to dive into and to study on your own. And do it on your own. You get it great while you're here. Praise God. Uh, my my father-in-law is one of the, the best Bible teachers that I know. But you also need the word every day. You really do. And I do. I'm not speaking just to you on that one. I need the word of God every day. And to dig into it and to look at it and to see it. You know, and as my hair is, uh, this relates, I promise. As my hair gets thinner as I get older, and I look in the mirror, you have to kind of do it in a certain way so you can't see it as much, right? And I never really look into the mirror and forget that I need to kind of adjust my hair in a certain way because it's, it's my reflection. And the same way when we look into God's word, if it reveals something about who we are that's ugly and we wouldn't want anyone to see, much less the Lord, king of the universe, who knows our hearts, when you look in the mirror and you see that balding part of your heart that really ugly side of your heart and then you don't do anything about it the lord's not pleased by that do we want to be a disciple that's there to the very end yeah if we do we need to follow him not just in location but in heart the place where god sees us the deepest and knows us and the challenge for all of us today is that Are we following the Lord through the revelation of his word? When he speaks and shows you your sin, my sin, do we say, God, let's deal with that tomorrow? (laughs) Or do we say, Lord, I am yours. That is wrong. I acknowledge that. What would you like me to do about it? Let me say that again. God, that is wrong. I acknowledge that. 
what would you like me to do? It's a challenge for us to do that, isn't it? When my wife comes to me with a problem, something that I've been doing that is horribly wrong, which happens infrequently, no, it happens a lot. And when she comes to me with that, I'm always defensive at first. My natural inclination as human being is to be defensive. And it will be yours the same when it comes to your time with the Lord. So I just want, I want us to really decide today to ask the Lord, say, God, when I read your word, give me something practical to do. I want to challenge you. If you, if you have a difficult time maybe um, getting, walking with the Lord right now, or you feel dry, pray before you read God's word. And this is practical. You probably have already known it, but it's so simple. Do this. Pray and say, God, give me something practical to obey and walk by faith in today. And as you read the word, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you something. Always does, even if it's small. He'll reveal something. And, and I like actionable points. When I'm in meetings, I like to know what I need to do afterwards. I, I need that to actually make progress. Write it down. And, and I say, God, give me an actionable point of something to walk out my faith as a disciple of you today. And the Lord will give it to you. And as we do that, this is how the Lord begins to grow and draw our hearts closer to him. Not only do they follow the Lord. I want to look at something else here. What does it say? The next thing, not only did they follow, but they also ministered to him. Ministered to him. I love this word. This word is the diakoneo. This is the errand runner, the Uber Eats guy. Remember? We already talked about him. It's back. And the, this word is here. This is their heart. They understood it. They didn't say, hey, I am a disciple of Jesus. They said, I am the lowest of low, the servant of all, not just for God's people. Careful. Not just for God's people. They said, I am going to minister to Jesus. And that has to be our heart. That was their heart. We are called servants of Christ in Scripture. And we love that because it sounds so humble, right? I'm a servant of the Lord, brother, you know? But then when someone treats us like a servant and treats you like a slave and says, would you go pick that up and, you know, do that, then we don't like it anymore. Because the, the, my title, if someone treats me like that title, it can be a little bit offensive. You ever have somebody when they're at your house just like hand you a dirty dish? It's a little bit grating. It's like, but they are at my house and it is my job to serve them, so that's fine. This is what we're called to do with the Lord. Jesus even warned us. He said, if you want to be first, you need to become the servant of all. So I know this is so basic this morning, but I want to challenge us back to the roots and the foundation of our faith. Not only reading God's word and asking him for practical things to do to correct our heart and our lives in accordance to his word. But secondly, to minister to Jesus. When we view ourselves in light of this expectation, it changes everything. If I come into a room, if I come into this room and I say, today I am teaching the word of God, right? then there becomes this emphasis on, on me. I need to do this. I've got to do this. If I come in today and I say, Jesus, I am your servant, that changes the attitude in the room. It changes the attitude in your heart. God, I'm here to serve you. Not these people, because that can be overwhelming. That can, that can put our eyes on them. The humility of servantship is kept right there. And they weren't in this position of honor, or blessing, or even respect. They weren't the 12 disciples, were they? These women were just there every single day to watch where Jesus was going, to go exactly wherever he was going and stay there with him all the time. And then the third role that they would do is they just did whatever he practically needed to get done, whatever it was, whether feed him, clothe him, give him anything, they were there for that. And they met the needs of his body. You see that Jesus was sustained by a, financially by a lot of these women. That they fed him when he needed it. And I, we brought up the point earlier about uh, Salmone, how she was going out the next day to even take care of his body once he was crucified. I mean, they didn't even stop when he died. That was their heart. I'm here to serve Jesus, and his body needs to be prepared. He's dead, but his body needs to be prepared for burial. They were there the next morning early regardless. Why? Because they were serving Jesus. It was their responsibility. They took it upon themselves. They weren't even named one of the 12. It doesn't matter if you have a title, brothers and sisters. 
It is your responsibility to serve Jesus. Whether or not anyone else knows who you are. Oh, excuse me? Who are you? Oh, are you a deacon? Are you an elder here? No, but God just is calling me to serve him today, and I would love to pray for you. God is calling me to serve him today, and I would love to preach the gospel with you. Why? Because you're his disciple, and you're there to minister to his needs. How beautiful is it? That they met the needs of his body. They fed him. They clothed him. They were going to anoint his body with spices for burial. But Jesus physically, his body, right, isn't here anymore. It was raised up into heaven, seated at the right hand of God. So how exactly does this apply to us here in 20, what is it, 19 now? I almost said 2009. That's, I'm, that's crazy. 2019 here and now what do we do well uh, you, those of you that know your word are probably thinking about a lot of verses because the body of christ is still here and we read in colossians 1 verse 24 and 25 i now rejoice in my suffering for you and i fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of christ for the sake of his body which is the church of which i became a minister wait so paul understood something really important that he was ministering to whom the body of Christ, as he ministered to what? The church, not a building, the people. Brothers and sisters, this is where our ministry is focused, on the people around you. When you walk into these doors, when you are ever with believers, pray and ask the Lord to show you how you can be part of building the church. That doesn't mean necessarily painting or literally doing that for a building. It means investing in the people around you for the sake of the gospel, encouraging speaking to another, one another in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, being a blessing to those around you, investing in the body of Christ. How sweet it is. This is so practical, you guys. I love the fact that the Lord has called us to do that. The body of Christ I I is still here, and we're called to serve him, and we get the opportunity to be just like these believers, saying, Lord, where do you want me to do? Uh, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And how can I serve your body today? How can I meet your needs today, his desires today? God, how can we bring pleasure to your heart today? And as you ask that, the Lord will speak. The Lord will lead you. The Lord will guide you. Well, did they just do all of this? Did they follow the Lord and did they minister to Jesus? They did it not just uh, alone. They did it to him. It ends by saying that. And what an example. This great work, the greatest work you could ever have in your life is to be the friend of God that you get to stay next to him and you get to serve him. It's not just for your ministry. I mean, it's important what, you, what the Lord's called you to, but that's not what it's all about. It's not just for the praise of man or for your wife to think, oh yeah, you know, my husband's pretty, pretty awesome. And for the pastor to see you and think that you're doing a great job. It's not just for the success of a movement or in, in your country, in, in America, or in Italy where we are. It's not just, that's not the reason that we should serve the Lord. The reason we should serve the Lord is because we are his disciples. In Colossians 3.23, it says, Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance. For you serve the Lord Jesus. You serve Jesus. You wake up, regardless of what job you have, that's not your main priority anymore. When you wake up in the morning, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 10 a.m., whatever time you wake up, for whatever job you have, that is not your main priority. Yes, be a fantastic employee. Be the best employee they have. Because God's called you to that as a believer, and that's a good witness to the Lord. But your, your main boss is Jesus Christ. And he's got something for you to do today, every day. And that's how all, every single one of us, whether you're stationed in Italy, whether you're stationed in New Hampshire, this is how we're called to serve Jesus every day, is to follow the Lord and be a part of his eternal ministry in the lives of those around us. Now with that, there's, uh, there, there, the Lord is doing something really su uh, sweet, I believe, in, in our area. And I wanted to speak a little bit about, about it and just kind of talk a little bit culturally how this can be a difficult concept. Um, where we're at in Feltre, uh, it's about two and a half hours from Austria. And as far as we know, there's no Protestant uh, Bible teaching church between us and there. 
we haven't found anything yet. So if there are any, pray that the Lord connects us with those people. We'd love to meet them and fellowship with them. From where we are at to the, I believe it's the east, um, the closest uh, Bible teaching church is about 30 minutes away, 20, 20 minutes away, 25. And then the other, uh, the south is 45 minutes is the closest uh, church. And then the other direction is an hour and 20 minutes away. That's crazy, right? Because how many do you drive home? How many do you uh, drive by on the way home? Uh, how many other churches? Maybe great, great Bible teaching churches. And I'm not diminishing what God is doing here in New Hampshire. I hope that people start to get crazy saved here and just transformed by the gospel. Because every church in this area would not have enough seats if that was the case. That's what we need is the Lord to begin to move in our generation. But as we look at this overwhelming work and we look at the, the, the majority of the people there um, were raised in a very uh, religious background but with, without a living faith. And they'll tell you the same thing. I'm not speaking for them. And we see this, this emphasis. It's so interesting because how quick this emphasis of being a disciple can get shifted to something else. So uh, we're hearing this together this morning that we're called to follow Jesus and minister to him. But beware because the enemy will want to twist that and he'll want to change the focus to something else. And it's so easy because what we see in the correlating scripture between Mark 15, uh, 40 and 41 is another one that shows the people at the base of the cross in John 19 verse 20 and we get the mentions there of these the people at the base of the cross and who are they it's the same people we add in the disciple that Jesus loved which is arguably John and I agree with that and we see at the foot of the cross um, all of these people are there Jesus looks at him and he says uh, speaking of Mary he says behold your mother he's speaking to John behold your mother and and uh, and from that hour the disciple took her to his own home now, in my cultural context of where I'm living and serving, this verse is now twisted to mean that all of us should call Mary our mother. So this whole text about following Jesus, being a disciple of Christ, he's on the cross, he is our Savior, it's now twisted and the focus becomes not Jesus, but Mary. This is, it's absolutely crazy when you read Scripture. And, and so I wanted to, to speak a little bit on that just because this is where the world that we're serving in. And I thought it would be an interesting note for all of, for all of you to kind of hear. And I say this in love because we have a ton of, you know, Catholic, lovely, amazing friends that love Jesus and are saved by faith, I believe, wholeheartedly. But in where we're at, hardly anyone, all right? And so I say this in love, but when we look through Scripture, um, they, they, they have venerated Mary. To a point where they would call her the mother of God. And I understand maybe the nuances of that. But even in this text, she wasn't called that. But they, they spiritually, we have no father other than the Lord. Matthew 23, 9 says, don't call anyone on the earth father. For one is your father who is in heaven. So we give that role of father only to God. To no one else. And it's so dangerous. And this is why Jesus warned us of that. Jesus also made a reference that his, uh, that his father being God countlessly. And he always spoke about God being his father. And he spoke about his mom very, very infrequently. And when he spoke of her, as mentioned that, that I spoke about earlier, was when he said that whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. It's not that Jesus didn't love his mom. It's just that he's emphasizing the truest identity of himself, which is he is the son of God. That is the truest identity of Jesus Christ. And so we, we, we can't get distracted. You see how easily that focus shifted. Brothers and sisters, don't let it happen to you. We see also, they, they, um, we have a friend of ours that recently went to this, um, uh, it was like a Stages of the Cross sculpture uh, art exhibit. It's like the different, Jesus was whipped, and there was a sculpture about that, and then the, the uh, road to, uh, you know, the, the cross, and anyways, all of this. She goes to this event, and, and she's, you know, awesome. Just arrived. She's serving with us in our church. And, uh, and so she goes to this event, doesn't speak hardly any Italian, and she's in the room. And they begin at this art exhibit, which is really fancy and posh. You know, they start to give out hors d'oeuvres and all of that. And then they shift to the, the statues, and they start to bless every single statue and anoint it. And then everybody, everybody in the room begins to do the Hail Mary prayer not just once, but like 40 times at every stage of the cross. And she was like, what on 
earth is going on, you know? And, and finally, at the very end, they turn around, and there's a statue of, of Mary on the wall in the building, and they begin to anoint that and do it all over again. And, she, and she's like, this is downright idolatry. And I, I'm not staying for those people that you know in your life that, that maybe have been raised in the Catholic Church and all of that, and, and the Lord's working on their doctrine. I'm not saying that they aren't necessarily saved, but that was idolatry. And it's important for us as Christians to, to know why we believe and, wh- and what we believe and have a firm scriptural reason for that. When we start to look in, into scripture, we see that Jesus is our only mediator. Only mediator. The word mediator can have two different kind of um, uh, implications to it. Someone that intervenes physically between two different people. And in 1 Timothy 2, 5, we see there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. That's it. Basta, as they say in Italian. That is it. No other option. The next thing that we see is the mediator could also be someone who communicates between two people. Not just is physically there, but also communicating and passing, passing notes like the sixth grade love stories. Jesus is that as well. Jesus is that, too. Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore, he is also able to save them to the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus does not need a break. He doesn't, hey, Mom, could you actually take over for me on this intercession for a while? You know, I'm a little tired. He doesn't need that. And so because of that, it is important for us to think biblically. I'm not saying that other people are stupid for thinking otherwise. What I'm saying is read the word of God and know why you believe what you believe. Because it's really easy to get distracted otherwise. And so, um, you know, with that, my biggest fear is that, is that this cultural um, adaptation of these, um, these national legends and, and idolatrous beliefs have been adopted into the church. And it scares me. And so pray for this, because there is a spiritual battle. When I taught this section, this, these exact verses, uh, about a month ago at our church, um, uh, we both, Rachel and I, walked into the church service that night, and something was off. There was a spiritual battle. I know it. I'm not one that says every time someone steals my parking lot at Target that it's a spiritual battle. <laughs> not that guy. There was a spiritual battle going on that night. And we walked into the room, and everybody had, like, a weird look on their face, and something was going wrong. The sound wasn't working. The Facebook Live wasn't working. Nothing was going right. And it's n- never been like that since we've, we've been there for the last year. The, the worship was even kind of strange and off that evening, and we get up there, and I just felt this, like, fear, overwhelming fear. And I never get a, a feel like that before I teach. And, and so we stopped, and I, I said, we really, we always pray before, but we really need to pray today. Let's pray. And we prayed, and I just sensed the Lord begin to liberate that, giving joy and, and peace. But even as we got to these verses, I, I had a few a uh, large text before it as well. And as we got to these verses, the words began to come out of my mouth like molasses. There was just something holding back the, 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 the truth about this. There is a spiritual battle in our place. There's a spiritual battle here. It's just different because the enemy wants to twist the word of God that we would not follow in spirit and truth. Disciples, you are disciples. And you're called to follow in spirit and truth. And the Lord is challenging us this morning to be the kind of disciples that don't get distracted from what? Following him. And secondly, ministering to Jesus. Don't let the mom of Jesus get you distracted. Don't let anything else ministry, don't let anything get you distracted, brothers and sisters. You are disciples of Christ if you've surrendered your life to him. And I know he has beautiful things he wants to do through your life. My wife and I really are grateful to be part of sharing what God is doing, not only to say praise God for his work where we're from, but also for you, and we hope you're encouraged to know that God is working, and like he's working in our country, he's working here, and he's working through you, and God can do beautiful things through you as you yourselves are called disciples, sent out, following the Lord. We always pray. My wife and I, we always pray that the Lord would, you know, as Jesus says, pray that there would be more laborers in the harvest, right? We do. We pray that. 
And we pray that God will bring out a couple more, um, you know, solid Bible teaching, uh, you know, uh, couples that can come and disciple. We also just pray that the Lord would continue to raise up support prayer, prayer-wise, and, and he's done that through your church and financially. The Lord is raising up an army to reach the world, Italy and beyond, and we're just grateful that all of us can be part of God's work, right, in this last generation as disciples as we follow Jesus. So I'm going to close in prayer. Um, and ask the Lord to, to do this in our hearts. Father God, we love you. And we just thank you. Lord, we, we know that as we read your word, you're going to speak to us. And we don't want to ever take that for granted. When you speak, I pray that we would do it. That we would set actionable items, whatever we need to do, to just live and walk by faith, Lord. We don't want to be the type of people that get there and see you one day and you say, actually, I never knew you. And so, Lord, I, I pray that you would speak to every heart, that you would affirm to them, Holy Spirit, move in every heart in this place. If there's anyone that has never received Christ, that has never received the gospel, believed in, in the work of, of the cross, I, I just ask that you would speak with, uh, with Dean as we sing these last two songs with Pastor Dean. But Lord Jesus, we ask that you would move in power by your Holy Spirit in this last day. God, for New Hampshire, we pray that you would deliver. God, that you would deliver those that are in chains to sin. That you would deliver them to freedom to be servants of Christ, Lord. God, we pray for this, the last days that we believe we live in. That you would help us to be fruitful. That you would help us to be faithful disciples. That we would follow you where you go. And that we would minister to you more than any. Uh, and that there would be no other option. No other second place. You and you alone. If today in this place God has given you something. That you know that you need to confess to him. During this time of worship. That's the time. If there's anything that, that you need to cry out to the Lord or anything you need to ask for strength in during this last set, that's the time. Father God, we commit these people, beautiful people to you. Thank you that we are your children. In Jesus' name, amen.